This is the nature of things. Shattering underground rock to get natural gas has opened up a hidden treasure trove. This can be one of the greatest gifts in the generation. It's also ignited a major controversy in Canada and around the world. Now people are asking, do we know what the risks are? Carbon disulfide, it's a neurotoxin that causes irreversible brain damage. Then we have all these potential health threats flowing across to where our kids are running and playing. It's not okay, there's nothing okay with this. And how does the drilling affect the one resource more important than gas? Water. The amount of fresh water that's being taken out of the water cycle is tremendous. We can't keep going like this. Even five years ago, not many people had heard of fracking. But now fracking, while a bonanza for gas and oil production, is caught in a backlash of suspicion and alarm. What's happening underground, it seems, can shatter more than just rock. In northern British Columbia, a gas well is drilling two kilometers into deep rock. This is hydraulic fracturing, fracking, and it promises a lucrative new energy source. If you had come and asked me or anyone 10 years ago, would North America now be leading natural gas producer in the world? Would 30% of the gas be coming from shale? Uh, the answer from everybody would have been, you can't be serious. We have a supply of natural gas that can last America nearly 100 years. I mean, the amount of natural gas that is in the Earth's crust probably lasts civilization until the next asteroid hits. There is a lot of gas out there. The only question is, at what price does it come out of the ground? Although fracking is the hottest frontier in energy, the way the gas is being extracted is raising concerns and controversy. Shale gas is only available because of new technology. Conventional wells drill straight down into pockets of trapped gas. Now, directional drilling taps into the source, deep layers of shale. At Cornell University, professor of engineering Anthony Engrafia is a specialist in rock mechanics and fracturing. Over three decades, his research has advanced hydraulic fracturing that can extract gas trapped in nearly solid rock. Along with directional drilling, fracking is a game changer. You can literally direct your well anywhere you want. You can make a left turn, a right turn, multiple curves. So that meant that you could now target a shale gas layer because you can now have a horizontal leg of the well that can be kilometers long. Next, the well is blasted with explosives to punch holes into the rock, then slammed with millions of liters of water, sand, and chemicals at extremely high pressures. Solid rock shatters like a smashed windshield. Once the hydraulic pressure has fractured the rock, the chemicals and water blow back out of the well, leaving tiny grains of sand behind to prop open the fractures. This allows gas to escape. You don't need to prop them open this much because a methane molecule is really small. If you can prop them open a few thousandths of an inch, that's plenty. Natural gas burns cleaner than other fuels, but extracting it is a dirty business. Water, treated with an array of chemicals to be more slick, becomes toxic fracking fluid. 750 chemical compounds are used in fracking fluids including carcinogens and air pollutants. Some compounds are trade secrets and legally exempt from public disclosure. Fracking fluid comes out of the well mixed with gas, which is vented into the air or burned in flares. Air quality and proximity to shale gas wells are big issues. North America's huge shale beds lie under both rural and urban areas. Thousands of wells are popping up. The question is, 
How many are too many? What we're going to see is a three to five acre well pad. And if you look one kilometer in any direction, you're going to see another one. And you're going to see pipelines by the thousands of miles. The first fracking operation started near the town of Dish, Texas in 2005. These days, Dish and the surrounding area are covered in gas well pads. The mayor of Dish, Calvin Tillman, saw his town change. I mean, it's just far as the eye can see, it's just pad side after pad side after pad side after pad side. And that's what people don't grasp. They don't grasp that there's, there's gonna be tens of thousands of wells, not just a few of them. In, in Texas, there is no place that's off limits. We put wells next to schools, next to daycare centers, next to senior citizens' homes. They are everywhere. I mean, if you drive down I-35W into Fort Worth, Texas, you're gonna see pad sites right in amongst the skyscrapers. You're gonna see compression stations right next to restaurants and hotels. And every well that they don't drill is money, is profit that they've left on the table. As development escalated, Calvin began to realize things had gone terribly wrong in his town. We uh, experienced these pretty offensive odors on a regular basis that was coming from the compression station and processing facility. They would cause your eyes to water, scratchy throat, that sort of stuff. But we started to notice that my children would get nosebleeds at the same time that the odor would be present. The town of Dish commissioned and paid for an air study. They found high concentrations of dangerous chemicals. So carbon disulfide was one of the chemicals found, and it's a, a neurotoxin that causes irreversible brain damage. So you had basically 16 neurotoxins or carcinogens that were above you know, what we would want to consider safe. Calvin took the study to the media, and the report created a stir. The gas companies started limiting emissions and monitoring air quality in DISH. But even so, Calvin was faced with a difficult decision. My youngest son woke up in the middle of the night with a very massive nosebleed. And he was only five at the time. He gets blood all over his hands. They smeared down the hallway wall, gets in bed with his brother. There's blood all over both of their beds. It really kind of looks like a murder scene. And, you know, I woke up the next morning and, and my wife said, this is it, we gotta go. And so we, we started making plans at that point to put our house on the market. And I always ask people, what would it take for you to walk away from your home, where your children have all of their friends, where you go to church at, what would it take for you to have to walk away from your home? Because that's a decision we had to make. Since we've moved, my children haven't got any nosebleeds. Something there was triggering those nosebleeds. We're, we're very comfortable in that now. And so we've made the right choice to move. The state of Colorado has also embraced fracking, with tens of thousands of wells drilled in a few short years. The town of Erie is nestled near the Colorado mountains, laced with bike paths and playgrounds. In 2011, a group of mothers noticed their children were getting sick with the same symptoms, lots of food allergies and intestinal problems. And I said, why are five parents here talking about their kids having the same kind of problems? I don't understand what could it be related to. And one of the moms said, the only thing I can think of is they were fracking here when we were either pregnant or had infants. So that just kind of raised a red flag for me. They drilled the first well within a few hundred yards of our condo. And we didn't even question. We assumed that if it was being allowed to happen, that of course somebody made sure that this was okay. Over just a few years, dozens of well sites peppered the landscape in every direction. Fracking operations put well pads next to homes, parks, and playgrounds. One of the largest players is Canadian energy giant, Encana. 
When we went as mothers independently back to the oil and gas companies and asked them, you know, where's the proof that this is okay? Where's the proof that it's safe? I was personally told that I just needed to make a choice whether or not to trust them. It was that point in time when I realized that I was completely on my own and I had to do all my own research. Desperately seeking information, April Beach learned local scientists had collected air chemistry data from a tower outside Erie and were working on the analysis. It was a pretty shocking study. It showed that we have extreme levels of propane and butane in our air um, directly related to oil and gas operations. Completed gas wells can release chemicals called VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Some of them are carcinogens, and others are potent greenhouse gases. One study showed that in 2006, wells in eastern Texas were releasing over 1,000 tons of VOCs into the air every day. In 2012, the Erie moms learned that Encana was about to drill a well right next to their children's elementary school. It's called a Canyon Creek well pad. It will be approximately 600 yards from Erie Elementary and Red Hawk Elementary. Sure, it's greater than the 350 foot setback allowed by the state, but the big question is, is 350 feet really an appropriate setback for a school? The moms had had enough. They organized and fought back. My kids go to the uh, Red Hawk, the elementary school, and uh, my son has multiple illnesses. He missed over 30 days of uh, school last year. And he's not the only kid in our neighborhood. That's, there's probably five other kids just on my block that have been sick. Today, we are having the first Erie Rising rally to show our opposition to fracking near backyards and schoolyards. And this is a really big deal for us because we're just a bunch of moms, <laughs> you know? We've never rallied before, and um, it's, it's so important. Over here, we have the baseball fields, and there's two parks right here. Over there, we have a, a natural gas and oil pad. Then we have all these potential health threats blowing across, you know, the field to where our kids are running and playing. And it's, it's not okay. There's nothing okay with this. In March 2012, a study from Colorado confirmed their fears. Their health was at risk. Dr. Lisa McKenzie of the Colorado School of Public Health found unsafe concentrations of chemicals known to cause cancer and neurological damage within a half mile of shale gas wells. The risks were even greater during the fracking process when wells are vented or flared. Well, ethylbenzene and benzene are both carcinogens. Trimethylbenzenes, benzene, ethylbenzene, and the alkanes all have non-cancer effects as well, and these are neurological effects such as tingling of the fingers and headaches, and respiratory effects such as irritation of the nasal passages and throat. Like most states, Colorado doesn't allow fracking within 350 feet of human habitation. But Dr. McKenzie's research shows that seven times that distance is still unsafe. What we don't have is data to show how far away a well pad needs to be to be protective of public health, and that's a study that needs to be done. The parents in Erie already know they're too close, but the proposed Canyon Creek well pad is upping the risks even further for every child who goes to school in their community. They have not started drilling yet, so there's still time. Hey, ho, ho, fracking wells have got to go. Hey, hey, ho, ho, fracking wells have got to go. Hey, hey, ho, ho. We're really happy. We're really, really thrilled. All these parents that came out here and, you know, it just really shows the heart of the issue. All these kids are out here and they're walking to their own school. This is important, but not just for my kids. It's important for our kids. And, everybody's kids, all of our kids. Why the hell are we still doing this? Why are we having to march? Why are we having to do this? Why, do, why is the burden of proof still lie on us? 
fracking wells have got to go. Hey, hey. One of the Erie Rising mums has had enough. You know, I have 27 wells as of next week that have been drilled um, and will be producing in a half mile radius. That was enough for me. With four kids aged two to seven, I'm just not willing to stick it out and live in this environment. Yeah, we're starting to move next week. I've already started packing. And you know, this is really sad for my family. You know, I, I love this community. Air quality is a major concern, but the biggest fear with fracking is what it's doing to water. My job is to protect my kids. How do I protect them from this, you know? Pure methane. The most iconic image in the fight against fracking is the flaming tap. Foul drinking water near fracking operations has gotten more media attention than any other issue. And Dimmick, Pennsylvania is in the thick of it. That's some nasty stuff, isn't it? I come out of my well. Craig Soutner lives in Dimmick. He was the first of many to have water problems when Cabot Oil and Gas fracked a well under his land. They started drilling a well in August of 08, 976 feet away from us. And within a month of drilling, came home one night and I saw that the water was all contaminated. The Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection determined that cement casings on a series of shale wells had failed and allowed methane to contaminate drinking water. More than 30 families had problems. The gas company was ordered to supply them with bottled water. My daughter, she would get in the shower in the morning and she'd have to get out and lay on the floor because she thought she was gonna pass out from the methane. She had eczema on the inside of her arms, hives up and down her body, and she said, I wanna have kids someday. You know, my job is to protect my kids. How do I protect them from this, you know? I had people uh, call me crying you know, because they were so happy that, that somebody was looking at this issue and trying to put some hard data behind this. Duke University professor Rob Jackson headed a 2011 study on contaminants in water wells near shale gas pads. It was the first to show that homes within a kilometer of a shale gas well were 15 or 20 times more likely to have excessive methane in their water. At high enough concentration, a house is at risk of blowing up. We found concentrations of methane um, above 50 milligrams per liter. Uh, those are dangerous for, for flammability and explosion purposes. But we don't know if, if breathing methane in lower levels over long periods of time could impact human health. The big question is how methane got into the drinking water. The fear is that pumping fracking fluid at extreme enough pressures to crack solid rock could allow the chemicals and methane gas to flow upwards and contaminate drinking water. We can see exposed here layers of shale and sandstone, similar to what would, one would see if one were 800 meters below us here. There are horizontal fractures, but also intermittent, large vertical fractures. Is it possible for the hydraulic fracturing fluid to migrate vertically a thousand meters or more, 2,000 meters, to come into contact with an underground source of drinking water. Any good engineer would say the following, it's not impossible and it doesn't happen every time. But that's a real wide limit. <laughs> we don't think it's necessarily the process of hydraulic fracturing itself that causes it. So fundamentally, I, I think it's about well construction. Pumping cement down a gas well so it can seal the casing pipe is a complicated procedure. Just over 6% of wells develop cracks and leaks in the cement linings meant to protect groundwater. It's a small but significant percentage, considering how many gas wells are drilled. In addition to the problem of methane in drinking water, there are other environmental concerns. The fracking fluid that returns to the surface 
called flowback, is laced with salts, heavy metals, and even radioactive elements from deep underground. It can be reused for fracking, but soon becomes too contaminated. Ultimately, it has to be disposed of. The question is, how? Initially, fracking wastewater was dumped into streams or dumped on fields, contaminating them. The wastewater was shipped to municipal treatment plants, but it was too polluted for them to treat. Line pits were tried, where the water could evaporate and the sludge buried. That practice has been discontinued because of environmental and health concerns. The, the issue of pits, and that's been an evolution of, of our industry, quite frankly. Um, we've moved away from the use of open pits as the long-term implications of the use of um, open pits have been understood. The green space here uh, was an evaporation pit for about six years. No one knew uh, that those were evaporation pits. So all of the toxic produced water was then just left there on the surface in it was in the middle of an open field. I mean, my kids were babies when we lived there, and I was pregnant with my kids there. But there were hundreds of kids and families that walked all over that field. Industry's solution to fracking water, too poisoned to be treated and returned to the water cycle, is to pump it deep underground. But pumping toxic water deep underground can cause yet another problem, earthquakes. Deep well disposal has been responsible for tremors in places like Colorado, Ohio, even northern BC. Uh, there are three instances that I'm looking at in uh, the Horn River Basin uh, north of Fort Nelson, where for seven or eight days in a row, on three different occasions, we have earthquake after earthquake after earthquake. Ben Parfit is a consultant specializing in water and environmental issues. Fresh water is taken and used in these fracking operations. It is so toxic at the end of those operations that it cannot be reintroduced to the environment again. So we're permanently removing water from the hydrological cycle. Millions of liters of water are needed to frack a single shale gas well. There can be dozens of wells on a single pad. Thousands of trucks are needed to haul the water for each well and to haul the waste away for disposal. It's a massive amount of water that is being lost forever. We're at uh, Elk Lake, just outside uh, downtown Victoria. It's about one and a half billion liters of water uh, in Elk Lake and Beaver Lake combined. And that is the amount of water that is used today in a single multi-well fracking operation in Northeast British Columbia. It's a tremendous amount of water that we're using in these uh, fracking operations today. If the industry used all of the water uh, that it is assigned, it, it would be very close to the equivalent of what the city of Victoria is using in a year. Talisman's operations in northern BC needed so much water that they built a pipeline from BC's biggest freshwater reserve, Williston Lake. This put fracking in direct competition with water used for hydroelectric power and Vancouver's drinking water. In BC, the provincial government has exempted fracking from the restrictions other industries follow on water use. Instead of going through the Ministry of the Environment, gas companies get water access from their own regulator, the Oil and Gas Commission. Alberta has also made special arrangements for water access. Don Bester is a farmer and part of the Alberta Surface Rights Group. Water is central to his farm's survival, and he's fearful of what the excessive water use in Alberta will mean. It's just uh, open season on water. They're pulling water from rivers, aquifers, dugouts, lakes, wherever they can get their hands on water. The amount of fresh water that's been taken out of the water cycle is tremendous. And what we're saying is we can't keep going like this. We can't keep drawing water, fresh water, and deep well disposing it. It doesn't make sense. 
we've seen a lot of droughts over the years and we need every drop of water in our water tables, not going down deep well disposal units. In the era of global warming, there are forecasts of worsening droughts. Now we are removing trillions of liters of fresh water for fracking. Drought is, is a big concern moving forward uh, in light of climate change. There is, without question, uh, a great deal of concern throughout the world about declining availability of, of water and groundwater. The question is, who is taking the, the bigger picture view? Who's actually looking at whether or not what the industry is proposing to do moving forward can actually be uh, sustained? And, and that is the big question that is hanging out there unanswered. With so many questions outstanding, not everyone is embracing fracking. Our Vermont governor stood up to the oil and gas industry and said, it's not going to happen here. Laren Odette lives in the village of Saint-Louis, Quebec, near Montreal. When gas companies drilled a test well in 2011, the local residents had a nasty shock. The brûlage du gaz s'est poursuivi pendant two mois et demi, jour et nuit. Et à un moment donné, il y a eu deux explosions. Et à la première, en plein milieu de la nuit, et à la première, c'est tout le village de Saint-Louis qui s'est éclairé tellement la flamme était haute. Il y a même des citoyens un peu plus loin qui ont téléphoné aux pompiers et pensaient que le feu était pris dans le village. Je vous dirais qu'à 2 heures du matin, se faire réveiller par un boom comme ça qui fait trembler ta maison, c'est assez traumatisant, merci. Est-ce que j'ai peur? Euh... <rire> Maintenant qu'on sait, bon. Maintenant qu'on sait tous les risques d'émanation, les risques pour la santé, j'ai déjà eu un cancer et je voudrais pas que ça, que ça reprenne. Je suis en rémission. Je voudrais pas que ça, ça, ça réapparaisse. Alors, si j'ai peur, oui. Opposition to fracking spread quickly in this quiet corner of the province. We have uh, Mont saint hilaire here, which is a lovely neighborhood. And it's the mayor who got a phone call from a citizen saying there's these big white trucks in the city. And he realized that it was shale gas. And then, how we say in Canadian, the shit hit the fan. When leaks and test wells near a daycare center became public, the response was swift. Will you bring your kid to a daycare center if there's a well close to it? No. The government said we won't allow wells in urban areas. But what does that mean? Does that mean that in Montreal you, we won't have any? The people of Quebec were outraged. In April 22nd, you know, it's, it's the Earth Day, and in Montreal we were 300,000 people in the street to say we don't want shale gas, we don't want fossil fuel, we want a new energy strategy. The government is not able to manage crisis. So if they want to impose something on people, they will live with the, with the results. People don't want that, and now they're awake. The oil and gas industry paid heavily for their mistakes in Quebec. The backlash was so strong that the province stopped all shale gas drilling until a review of the industry could be completed. Billions of dollars in potential profit for gas companies disappeared. The backlash in Quebec set a devastating precedent for the industry because shale gas sits under vast areas with dense populations. Most of New York State, Lake Ontario, and the greater Toronto area. Even in less populated provinces like New Brunswick, the opposition to fracking prompted a halt in drilling in 2011. The industry is now facing intense scrutiny. It had never really been questioned before. You know, we've done what we've done up until a couple, three years ago when there's really been a lot of questioning. Well, 
how do you do this and what impact might it have on me and prove to me that I'm safe. Gas companies are scrambling to find new fracking methods they hope will reassure an anxious public. You know, we could use seawater. We don't have to have clean, fresh water. Uh, so there's any number of options. The industry works very hard to do the right thing. The industry does have its supporters. For landowners in the U.S., like Jim Grimsley, shale gas leases can provide anywhere from a few thousand to hundreds of thousands of dollars. The vast, vast majority of people are in favor of natural gas and drilling. It really is primarily, I think, economically. It's just, it's good for them. Uh, a lot of the farms up here had shut down and you go around now and you see a lot of these farms are back up and open and you see new structures going up. You see a lot of new equipment. Put a lot of people to work up here. I think he's put a lot of people, a lot of people to work that never had a job. Now they got one. I'm happy to see the gas people pay me. Money and jobs come with a gas boom but so do problems that divide communities. It takes, on average, about a thousand trucks to drill and complete a well. It's a lot. I mean, I live on a quiet gravel road, you know, with nine houses. We, each of us has our, our own private water well, and we live on a quiet gravel road because it's quiet. You know, one day there's a, a well pad going up in the field across from someone's house, and there might be a thousand trucks that pull in over the, you know, the drilling of the, the well that goes onto that pad. And you know, small towns have uh, you know, 18 wheelers driving through the new caravans all the time, and it, it disturbs the, the quiet, if you will, and it also disturbs the, the social fabric for people. You have some people who are really grateful for the, the money that they've received from the companies, and, and you have other people that are just violently opposed to it, um, either from what's happened to them or from the, you know, the change in their lifestyle that it's, it's brought about. Literally, you have, you know, I've seen fathers and sons who no longer speak to each other because they, you know, they can't find common ground on this issue. In New York and Vermont, protest movements have resulted in action. New York State has a moratorium in place, and many want it to become a permanent ban. You guys want your kids to take showers in water like this? No! You want, you want them to drink water like this? No! We're here to ask our governor to evolve to ban fracking now! 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 Vermont has banned fracking. Vermont legislators and our Vermont governor stood up to the oil and gas industry and said, it's not going to happen here. We hope other states will follow our lead. In Canada, one 2012 poll found 62% of Canadians support a moratorium on fracking. France and Bulgaria banned fracking outright. Australia has the lock the gates movement, while the UK has adopted the more populist frack off campaign. Bans and moratoriums are closing off towns, states, and entire countries to shale gas development. But in communities like Erie, Colorado, fracking is part of the landscape. Our choice is taken away. I can choose what foods to feed my children. I can choose whether to give them organic or not but I don't get a choice in what's going into the air that we breathe anymore. And we're left to have our children be guinea pigs. No fracking! No fracking! People are concerned about their drinking water, people are concerned about their air quality, and, and so are we. So it's not in our interest to be um, trampling on, on people's rights, people's values. You know, it, it is not in our interest to be in a community where we're not a community partner. We respectfully request that Ikana Corporation halt all drilling operations at the Canyon Creek well pad. Please, this is our Mother's Day wish. We've tried to ask them, you know, in a formal letter. We've given them petitions signed by 21,000 people. Go somewhere else, pick another site, like 
This is our brand new $13 million Green Star School. And one of their responses was, well, what about the people who own the mineral rights? And that's where you're going and you're putting wealth before health. The eerie rising mums lost their fight. The Canyon Creek well was completed in the summer of 2012. And Canna did limit some of the chemicals used in fracking and reduced emissions, but the well is now producing gas. In Canada, oil and gas producers have had a major role in the economies of Alberta and BC for generations. I wouldn't call the relationship between the oil and gas and our current government as an entrenchment. I think they're in bed together. And it's big dollars. I mean, it's pretty near all of Alberta's budget. So. Canadian landowners aren't sharing in the wealth and have limited rights. Unlike U.S. landowners, most Canadians don't own the rights to the minerals beneath their property. The government does. And the government assigns those rights to oil and gas companies. All a landowner gets is a token payment for access and little power to refuse. In British Columbia, Gwen Johansson has been fighting for landowners' rights for more than a decade. No. You cannot say no if a, an oil company wishes to come onto your land. A land agent for the oil company will come and they will make, uh, uh, they call it negotiation, but truly there is no negotiation because the landowner really has no bargaining power and they can ask for um, an access order to, uh, so they can force their way onto the property. Well, you, you feel powerless. Where it gets really difficult is where you're looking at the intangible values like the quality of life, the uh, quiet use and enjoyment. Those kinds of things, those things uh, you, can't, you can't measure in dollars. Even Dr. Ingrafia, who pioneered hydraulic fracturing, has serious concerns about where the technology is taking us. So those of us who aren't going to gain anything financially are asking ourselves, we're shaking our heads and scratching our heads saying, wait a minute, we're gonna risk our property values, we're gonna risk our water, we're gonna risk our air, we're gonna risk our health, we're gonna exacerbate climate change. And what do we get out of this? We lose what we have, we lose why we live here. Fracking has already changed the energy picture, but it's about to ramp up to an even bigger boom. The oil and gas industry has hit a wall of public opposition. The backlash against fracking has cut off towns, provinces, and entire countries from shale gas development and cost the industry billions in potential profits. When the shale gas boom first hit, thousands of wells were drilled before the risks were fully understood. I do think the, the gold rush mentality is responsible for some of the problems, absolutely. Um, you know, when I'm in a hurry, I make mistakes, and I think people on the ground and, and, and drilling are in a hurry, they make mistakes too. Well, certainly there's some bad players in, in this industry and any other industry. We all make mistakes. The whole industry gets painted with the same broad brush, unfortunately. That's just a fact of life. Bad press is not the only issue for gas companies. The boom in fracking has resulted in a surplus of natural gas in North America and prices have plummeted. In North America, the industry, the natural gas industry, has served to effectively slit its own throat. <laughs> this technology has been so successful, it's created a glut. Now the industry is looking to Asia, where prices are three times higher. To ship the gas overseas, it must be compressed into liquefied natural gas, 
or LNG. Pipelines and compressor facilities will require an investment of billions of dollars. But gas producers are betting LNG terminals will be the future. First, the industry will need to overcome strong opposition. Uh, I start from a premise that um, industry um, has not had a great track record in terms of being what I call on the front foot with our stakeholders. And we now need to sort of be out there as an industry um, making the case for shale gas and making the case for responsible shale gas development. Now to demand of this industry to operate in an environment or in such a way that there is zero risk is unrealistic. No industry can do that ever has. You can't go into hospital and be guaranteed that you're going to walk out. All right? So it's how you manage these things that's important. Some larger companies are adopting green completion, where all the gas is captured and processed to reduce venting or flaring. We run the pipeline to the well site before we actually complete the well, and then we can flow in line. So it greatly reduces any flaring. A few hours, maybe a, a day at the most, uh, is all that we would be flaring. Uh, before, there would have been uh, several days, possibly, of it. There is no flaring or venting on these well pad sites. It does address a big major issue with air emissions. But these costly green initiatives are not universal. So you can tell Exxon, spend the money. Exxon will spend the money. Tell Shell, we'll spend the money. But there are over 60 companies in Pennsylvania operating in the Marcellus. Most of them are mom and pop shops. They can't afford it. They won't do it. New regulations from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency will end flaring of shale wells drilled after 2015. But the regulations still allow each well to vent up to five tons of volatile organic compounds every year. The new limits do not apply to existing wells. Canada has no national standards for flaring. Each province has jurisdiction over oil and gas regulation. Uh, there have been very few, almost no studies, comparing the costs, benefits and trade-offs of those different ways of doing hydraulic fracturing. And uh, so if we're going to make good decisions, I think we need that information. Alberta and BC are pushing ahead with fracking for shale gas, while Eastern Canada is taking a more cautious approach, wanting answers to unresolved questions. What is a proven safe distance for a shale gas well from a home? Will Canadian wells be allowed to flare or vent carcinogenic gases? What is an acceptable failure rate for wells pumping millions of litres of toxic water? We really want to understand now what is the potential of, of uh, water contamination into, into drinking water. How are we going to address the climate change issue if we keep taking fossil fuels out of the ground and combusting them and putting CO2 into the atmosphere. How big are the impacts? And can we afford to remove trillions of litres of water from our water cycle forever? If we don't look at the way industry development is projected to unfold in the next little while, there's a very real chance that we do irreparable harm uh, to our water resources and environment. Now maybe this is the time to really think this thing through and what the best way is to develop those resources to the maximum benefit of all, all Canadians.